was uh, Lamech lived 182 years, had a son, and he named him Noah, saying, This one will provide us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands out of the very soil which the God placed under a curse. And so he is a relief from the curse of God, is, is, is hmm. his name, is what it means. Um, this call back to, uh, call back to creation is also going to be found in the, in the flood narrative uh, and almost setting Noah up as the, as the new Adam in this, mm. in this case. All right. Um, the flood narrative. There's not, uh, it's one that we are incredibly familiar with. We could probably go back, uh, probably could call some of the kids in from the Bible classes right now and have them come in and they could tell us something about Noah and the flood. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a popular story, and it's a popular children's story, although it seems odd that it's a nice children's story when everyone but Noah and his family drown. It, it just it doesn't seem like a real encouraging story in some places, but, but it's a good one, by the way. All right, so when the flood narrative, what we're going to see is we're going to see the reversal of creation. At the end of Genesis 1, God looks at his creation and he saw the creation that he had made and saw that it was very good. And in Genesis chapter 6, God looks on his creation and he sees the wickedness and it is not good anymore. Right. Right? As a matter of fact, God is even sorry that he did this, is what this says. And so he's going to cause this flood. And again, this is a reversal of what we see from Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, it says that, that there's darkness over the face of the earth, that the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the deep or over the waters. Mm -hmm. And God speaks and creation appears. And now creation is here and God's going to speak and water's going to cover it again. So it's uh, creation 2.0, right? right? We're, we're gonna, it's, it's a reboot is what we're going to do. But Noah finds favor. Noah finds favor with God. We've already mentioned that uh, he ca carries on the tradition of his great-grandfather of being someone who walks with God. He is described as blameless and upright. Um, he's called that more than once in this narrative. Pretty powerful. Yeah, that, that among everything that God sees, this one, this one, mm -hmm. is he finds favor. And that could be because maybe he is at least singled out in this narrative as the lone moral figure. Uh, nothing is really said. I mean, I, we, we, can I kind of imply or infer that his family are, are okay because God brings them in the, in the ark with him? But it, it seems that Noah is the one who's singled out, right? This, he's the guy. And the flood is imminent. It is coming. So the ark is commissioned. God says, I want you to build an ark. I, I found this really, really interesting, and most people won't, but sorry, uh, that this word, the Hebrew word that's translated ark is used two times, in two places. It's used here several times in this narrative, and the one other place that it's used is in the narrative of Moses' birth, and oh, the yeah. basket is, an is, ark. is what his mother puts him in. Wow. That's the, it's the same word, and it's the only time it's used in the Hebrew hmm. Bible. Uh, well, one is pretty good sized, and the other right. has got to be pretty right. small. <laughs> uh, and, and, if, and if you think about that for just a little bit, it, it, it kind of makes a little bit of sense, right? Moses' name, uh, which when we get to Moses, we'll talk yeah. more about that, is, uh, is he's named that because he was drawn out of the water. God will draw Noah out of the water, and he'll draw Moses out of the water, and he'll draw Israel through the water and drown and right. drown the Egyptians, and he will call us through the water right. and draw us out of the water. I mean, this is a theme that he, continues to go. He drew the creation out of the water. Uh, right, creation comes out of the water. And the creation is groaning to get back there. Yeah, but not back in the water. No, <laughs> back in creation. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. All right, good deal. Yeah, uh, so he draws us out. Noah is faithfully obedient. Four times, if I counted right, four times, uh, it's explicitly stated that Noah did just as the Lord commanded, right? 
-hmm. when it comes to building the ark, when it comes to getting the animals, when it comes to doing all these things, explicitly states in the text, and Noah did just as the Lord commanded. Um, and another time, it's not really stated that way, but we see it, right? And that's in chapter, in chapter 8. Um, yeah, chapter 8, 15, God spoke to Noah saying, Come out of the ark together with your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. Bring birds, animals, and everything that creeps on the earth and let them swarm out on the earth and be fertile and increase on the earth. And Noah came out together with his sons, his wife, his sons' wives, and every animal. So it, it, he does exactly what it is that, that God has asked him to do. Um, we're familiar, like I said, we're familiar a lot with the flood, the flood narrative itself, and, and, and the, the 40 days and then the, the length of time that, that the water is on the earth. Uh, but uh, chapter 8 and verse 1 is one of those places I want us to just to kind of kind of think about for a, a minute. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused the wind to blow across the earth, and the waters subsided. Uh, God remembers Noah. Uh, God doesn't just remember Noah. God remembers creation mm -hmm. the same way, right? right. I mean, and, and the, the beast and all. Uh, there's these, these other places in Genesis and even in Exodus where it says God remembers and what, and what that, kind of what that entails. One of us in uh, Genesis 19 says God remembered Abraham when he saved Lot from Sodom. So God remembers Abraham and does something. Uh, in Genesis 30, God remembered Rachel mm. and she conceives and begins to, and he opens her womb, and so she can conceive. And it may be the one, the most uh, familiar one to us in Exodus 2. God remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he hears the cries of the Israelites in Egypt and he acts. When God remembers these things, God does something. And it's not like, you know, all of a sudden God goes, oh, I remember those people. No, it's that he has made a promise and he's going to make good on it. Right. That's, that's kind of where we go. Um, Noah's name is found in other places in Scripture. Uh, one is in Isaiah. Let me find it here. Isaiah 54. Uh, if you start in verse 7 of Isaiah 54, and this is God uh, res going to restore Israel, or re restore Judah. For a little while I forsook you, with vast love I will bring you back. In slight anger for a moment, I hid my face from you, but with kindness everlasting I will take you back in love, says the Lord your Redeemer. For this to me is like the waters of Noah. As I swore that the waters of Noah nevermore would flood the earth, so I swear that I will not be angry with you or rebuke you. For the mountains may move and the hills be shaken, but my loyalty shall never move from you, nor my covenant of friendship be shaken, says the Lord who takes you back in love. Wow. Right, so there's that one. Ezekiel, uh, he's mentioned two or three times in Ezekiel chapter 14. Uh, when, when God is uh, pronouncing judgment to come on Jerusalem. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, O mortal, if a land were to sin against me and commit a trespass, and I stretched out my hand against it and broke its staff of bread and sent famine against it and cut off man and beast from it, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, should be in it, they would by their righteousness save only themselves, declares the Lord. And this is, this is repeated again in, in, in different places. Uh, Jesus speaks of Noah in Matthew chapter 24 when he talks about the end, you know, oh, the yes. end that's coming. Um, right, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Up until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Okay, and then uh, First Peter talks about this, uh, talks about Noah and Noah and salvation. Right. right? That through water, God saves Noah and his family. He's eight people. And that passage that we know pretty well of baptism that now does save you, mm -hmm. right? that God saves you this way. And in Second Peter, uh, Noah's not mentioned by name, but the flood is mentioned. Right. 
in conjunction with judgment. Uh, and then, and then, of course, he just mentioned in Hebrews chapter eleven sure. in that in that hall of fame. So, if you think about these different places where he is mentioned, we find Noah mentioned in with deliverance, with judgment, with judgment, with deliverance, and with judgment. So these kind of go together because that is the narrative of Noah: judgment and deliverance, judgment and mercy. Right. God sees that. Everything is evil, but he does not destroy everything. He, he, saves, he saves no one. So, all right. So I want us to talk about just about three or four things here just by way of application. And like I say, it's a familiar, familiar passage, but just some things that we need to, I hope that we remember. One is the importance of a life that's formed by God or has a, defined by a relationship with God. Again, Noah walks with God. And Noah is found blameless, and Noah is delivered. Right. Right? I, I think that, that speaks a lot to us. That, uh, and, and it's really tied to the second one, and let's go ahead and talk about it, the importance of obedience. Uh, God operates, has operated, continues to operate, uh, well, what Paul says, by grace through faith. faith. Right, and, and we see this with Noah. God gives Noah the, uh, he calls to Noah, he gives Noah the directions so that Noah can be saved. Noah cannot do this on his own. Noah would be like everyone else that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 if God doesn't tell him. They didn't know anything until the flood came. Right. And Noah would have been in the same, I was going to say in the same boat, but he would have been <laughs> in the same shape, right? So, so God calls to him. This is an act of grace and it's an act of mercy. But Noah doesn't, is not delivered unless Noah does what it is that God asks. Um, and in this case, it's build an ark and gather the animals and, and build it the way that, that God asked him to. And then even after when God remembers him to do the things that God's asked him to do after that. It's the same way. God works by grace through faith. It's by grace you have been saved, is what Paul says. But we're God's workmanship created to do things, right? Yeah. To do good works. And those good works are what he has called us to do. And so to be obedient is huge. Uh, it's, there's, there's not a substitute for that. Now, we, we don't obey our way into God's favor. No. We obey because of what he's done for us. Right. Uh, I think it's Dallas Willard who says that you know grace is opposed to earning. You know we can't we can't right. earn it, but grace is not opposed to effort. Right. You know we we still respond to that in in some way. Uh, this one is this one. The one I like is God remembers, even if no one else notices. <laughs> Excuse me. God remembers. I don't know. Uh, there's there's always been this speculation of what Noah goes through. Uh, as he as he builds the ark, uh, there's somewhere, and I, and that may be in Second Peter where he talks about Noah preaching during the building of the ark, right? Yeah. But but it, but you wonder how many people go by and go, this guy's a nut, you know? I mean, what I don't know what he's doing, you know? Has he, it rained before? Does he have a permit for this? You know. you know, I mean, I don't know what it is, but but you know, I don't know what he thinks he's trying to do. But God remembers, even if no one else does. Uh, I think this is, uh, I think it's kind of important for us. That even if no one else knows, and maybe sometimes especially if no one else knows, what it is we're doing, that God sees it. And, and I, I know we've talked about that as in our behavior, as in, you know, our trying to hide sin. And, and that, that's true enough, but I want us to look at it from the other side. That we may be doing good things that no one ever knows about. And that's fine, because God remembers. Right. Right? Th this, this doesn't just go unnoticed. Um, you know, Jesus talks about this with the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, that that's the one we're after, right. is that God notices, not anybody else. What does Jesus say? Not a cup of cold water? Right. Yeah. Will be given. Right. You know, Without you know, its reward. Right. So, so that's, that, that's one of the other things. And, and then the other thing I hope that we see 
in, in all of these people that we talk about is the faithfulness and the love of God. The first time the word covenant is used in the Hebrew Bible is in 6, is in Genesis 6, when God says, I'll make this covenant with you. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the ark, at the end of the flood narrative, when the waters recede, God says, and here's the sign of this covenant that I've made. But God is the one who's always faithful. He's always going to do what he said he's going to do. And that's good, unless we're on the wrong side. Uh, but we also see God's faithfulness and God's mercy. That it grieves God to the point that he would, would wipe out his creation almost. <laughs> but he doesn't completely. He goes, no, there's somebody. And, and, and I, we can talk about that more when we get into Abraham and when he starts moving towards Sodom with, with Lot, you know, right. of, of how low will God go before he says, okay, I won't destroy Sodom. You know, so the, this this idea of covenant and God's mercy. Um, if you go on into to Genesis chapter nine, you find you know Noah and the vineyard and and, and drinking and getting drunk. Um, one thing I really love about Scripture is it talks about these people that we meet, warts and all. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a tendency, and, and a good one in in some places. For, to find people that we meet in Scripture and go, all right, there's somebody. There's very few, there's precious few, that there is nothing ever negative. So, right. uh, Joseph is one. Right. Uh, Daniel seems to be one. And Jesus is Jesus. the other. Uh, that, that, have, that we don't really see anything said about them. But with, with everyone else that we meet, there are some real serious issues. But God still works with them and works through them. And I, I find that incredibly comforting right. because I have a lot of those. Right? That, Amen. If I, had to be, if I had to be perfect, it was gonna, that's going to be... It's already too late yeah, for yeah, us. Yeah, whoops. Uh, but but he, does, he, he still works through flawed creation to accomplish his purpose. Amen. All right, that's what I've got. Okay. Uh, our hero tonight is Abraham. It's, uh, we just want to talk about making uh, right choices and using Abraham and, and Lot. God had called Abraham to leave his family, his uh, friends, his home, the farm, and follow him. And, and Abraham did exactly what God asked, and that's a good choice, okay? Uh, I hope we've all heard uh, God's call for us to leave some things in this world and follow him. Uh, Abraham made a good start. He moved from the Ur of the Chaldees to a place called Haran with his father and uh, his brother and his nephew uh, by the name of Lot. Uh, here's the problem. Abraham only at this point obeyed God halfway, and that's a bad choice, okay? Instead of going all the way to, to Canaan, he camped here at, at Haran. Uh, after his father died, he traveled on to w w what we know as, as Canaan, as the promised land. But uh, initially, he stopped short of doing what God asked him to do. Another bad choice, instead of remaining in Canaan, for some reason, he decides to go to Egypt. And, and this results in an ugly situation. It's where he he, he, he claimed that Sarah, his beloved wife, was his sister and actually gave his wife to th this Pharaoh. Uh, this didn't work out well at all. And uh, as a result, uh, Pharaoh learned of, 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 of th this, this cover-up. And, uh, and, and so the whole deception idea got Abraham kicked out of of Egypt. So after several trials, Abraham does come and, and to Canaan, and, and he stays, and we're made to wonder tonight uh, how many trials and how much suffering Abraham could have avoided if he'd have just gone to Canaan like God asked and, and, and stayed there. And maybe that applies to 
us too, that our life, sometimes it does not go like we want it to go because we have started out obeying God, but we've stopped short of, of complete uh, uh, obedience. Abraham and, and Lot both raise sheep and, and other livestock. Uh, they're doing well for themselves. The flocks and the herds uh, uh, begin to multiply and they, they run into a problem. They need more grazing land. They need some water. Competition between the herdsmen becomes uh, 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 acute and Abraham makes the decision, okay, uh, we need to separate our, our two our, our two ranches here. And, and so he gives Lot the choice. Which way do you want to go? Uh, and, and so he just tells Lot, uh, you choose and, and, and I'll go the other way. Uh, scripture tells us this. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself the best part, the plain of Jordan, and he set out toward the east. In other words, Lot saw the land holding the best potential class for profit and pleasure. Hang on to those two words. He looked around and he said, hey, I remember the good times I had down in Egypt, mm -hmm. you know. And so now he's looking at profit and pleasure. And, and, and that, that, that will come back to, to haunt him. Uh, Lot chooses to go east. Well, didn't you have something to say last week about going east? Yeah, what was that? Yeah, if in, in Genesis, the, the move is that it, the, to go east is to go away from God. So he's going away from God. He's moving in the wrong direction. Okay, all right. Since we have history on our side, we know the, the result of this choice. Lot ended up, of course, in Sodom. His family was kidnapped. They had to be rescued. Uh, by Abraham. Uh, later, Lot was forced to, to leave Sodom when God destroyed the city for its sinfulness, much like the flood. Uh, again, we're made to wonder uh, if he learned the lesson for his desire for for, for here and, and this, this prophet uh, that he saw in, in Egypt. I suspect if Lot had it to do over again, he would do things differently. He's now lost his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham, on the other hand, ends up in, in Canaan, what we know today as Israel. And uh, God, he receives the blessings that God promises uh, to him. So here we are. What can we learn from this narrative about, about decision making? Uh, first, we learned that the more stuff class that we have, the more complicated life is going to be. I, you know, this is, just, this is just a fact. The more we have, the more complicated life is going to be. Why stop in Haran? What was it that caused him to stop there? Was it because he and Lot tried to take too much with them? You done that? You tried to move and take too much with you? I, I got it. I got, I'm suffering to that right now. You know, I, I've got a bunch of stuff in a barn on the farm. I got it at Karen's house. I've got the basement full and I can't tell I've, I've packed anything yet. So, so maybe, maybe this lesson is saying to me, don't take that stuff. You didn't need that. There's a, a, a great little book called Amish Peace. Uh huh. Uh, I, I got it, I read it, uh, and, and their philosophy is, and it's, it's kind of neat. Their philosophy is that they don't have much, but they have what's important, and they take care of what's important. You bet. Right? You bet. That's neat. They, they take care of what it is they need, but they don't accumulate more. Things, more stuff, a desire for more things, sometimes gets in the way of our seeing God, obeying God, uh, you know, Scripture says we ought to be like the Amish, content with what we have, you know, satisfied. James Dobson, I remember reading a story. He tells about buying a, 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 a swing set for his kids. And he said, you know, he labored for a, a week to put this thing together, all the instructions and the nuts and the bolts, and he got it together. And, 
And he said, then I read the last page. And he said, it says that these places need to be oiled or greased, not once a year, but once a month. And he said, I thought then, I don't own a, we a swing set. The swing set owns me. It can get that way at my house. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have so much stuff that we don't have time to do the good things and enjoy the good things in life because of the stuff. Uh, in his book, Three Men in a Boat, uh, Jerome Jerome uh, says, let your boat of life be light, packed with only what you need, a homely home, simple pleasures, one or two friends worth the title, someone to love, and someone to love you, and you will find your boat easier to pull, and it will not be so liable to be upset, and you'll have time to think, to dream, to plan, to play, and to work. Amazing. If we just unload some of our stuff. If we want to make good decisions uh, about our life, one of the things we need to do is just unclutter. Uh, uh, Alastair Begg, in his, in his book, made this, uh, uh, this statement. Uh, he gives us this list. He says, we are struggling with discontent if thoughts of money consume our day, if other people's success makes us jealous, if we define success in terms of what we'd rather have than who we are and what we are. If our family is neglected in pursuit of personal advancement, money, or things. If we close our eyes to genuine needs of others. If we're living in a paralyzing fear that we may lose everything we have. If we are prepared to borrow ourselves into bondage. Or if God gets the leftovers instead of the first fruits. Class. We need to pursue contentment and we need to free ourselves sometimes of the burden of things so we can make good decisions. Leads to the next point, God, uh, good choices began by asking the right questions. Lot uh, surveyed this land before him and then, and, and he saw this well watered area for his livestock. He saw that it looked like Egypt, and he could enjoy himself like he did in Egypt. Uh, and he, but he doesn't seem to ask the right questions. Nowhere in the record is Lot seeking for wisdom. Don't see him praying and saying, God, help me make a good choice here. Right. Uh, there's no record that Lot considered what was best for his family. There's no record that suggests that he struggled with his relationship with God. There is no record that he was concerned at all about what was the best decision that he could make. There's no record of saying, did he consider the lifestyle that he was supposed to live and how this might influence that lifestyle? Instead, we seem to see that Lot was motivated by profit and pleasure. There is no mention of quiet time with the Lord, no time with family, no caring for others, no obeying God or making preparations for the afterlife. He seems all wrapped up in two things. What's this going to gain me in profit and in pleasure? Uh, seeking this will cause us uh, sometimes to make a wrong decision. Uh, like Noah, our values need to be different mm -hmm. from the rest of the world. Our primary concern is not with profit and pleasure, but with how to glorify God and how to live with and enjoy His people. Don't you agree with that? We're a family, and God wants us to enjoy Him. He wants us to enjoy one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when we've got our eyes 
on profit and pleasure, though, you know, we, we can't make good decisions out here. Well, one more. In every choice, we must trust God's providence. Uh, interesting that Abraham's attitude changes after he goes to Bethel and worships for the second time. And as far as we can determine, as far as I could determine in, in Scripture, he had worshiped in Bethel and went to Egypt, and he hadn't been back to Bethel. But once he goes back to Bethel and, 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 he, and he worships, uh, he makes some good decisions. He goes on into the Promised Land to Canaan, and he, and he stays there. Uh, class, when we get our mind uh, around the fact that God is in control, that God loves us, that He's working all things out to our benefit, God never makes a mistake. Uh, we will do well if we will continue to worship Him, love Him, and fellowship uh, with Him. Because when we stop that worship, we lose a connection with Him somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, it just just does. Hey, three words, three words I want you to clear from, from your vocabulary, okay? I want you to clear chance, fate, luck. These words are nothing. They have no power. They have never done anything for anybody. Think about it. They're words. They have no power. They have never done anything for anybody, yet we, for some reason, use them. Listen to Scripture. It is God who is at work in you. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. It doesn't happen to your life or my life because of luck, because of fate, because of chance. Believing in these three words in my life or yours is fateful faithlessness. Uh, we just need to get back to believing that God is working in our life and trust His divine providence. He knows what's best for us. He loves us. He remembers us. Mm -hmm. He's going to take care of us. Okay. Review. All right, here we go. Rules for making right choices from Abraham and Lot. Obey God completely. Don't go halfway. Don't camp in Haran. We must stop deceiving others in, in order to protect ourselves. That's not right. Never throw others, including your family, under the, bo uh, uh, under, the, under the bus to protect yourself. Place the interest of others before our own. Unclutter our life. Give God His rightful place. God before stuff, things. Ask the right questions. Life is not about profit and pleasure. Never stop worshiping God. Trust Him because He loves us. Stop trusting in the things of the world and trust in His divine providence. May God bless our study together. Mark, you want to come and dismiss us? Father God, we are extremely grateful to be your children, to be able to come together tonight and to not only be encouraged by people of like mind, Father, but to study your word and to learn, Father, to learn what it is that you want us to know from the story of Noah and, and Abraham, Father. Father, we just pray that you'll help us to truly unclutter our lives. Help us to always put you first in everything that we do. Father, help us to look around and, and to see the need and then to act on that need, Father. Father, we thank you for your mercy and for your grace and for the way that you provide for us, Father. But all too often we take these blessings for granted. But Father, we do give you the praise and the glory. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask that you'll be with those who are struggling with their health, those who need surgeries or have had surgeries, we ask that you'll bless them and allow them to heal properly. And then, Father, we ask for comfort upon those families who have lost loved ones. 
Father, you know the needs of these people. And, and Father, we just pray, dear Lord, if it be your will, that you would work in their lives. Father, we just thank you again for the opportunity to come in fellowship this evening and to study your word. Father, we just ask that in all things that we do that we can glorify you. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> you.